Baruch Hashem, we're going to celebrate Rosh Hashanah uh, tomorrow, Bezrat Hashem. Uh, we still have a good chance that Mashiach is going to come and maybe it will change the theme of the holiday. If Chas V'Shalom Mashiach decides to wait one more day, then we will celebrate it as we do for the last couple hundred and thousand years. And there's a lot of different customs that we do that a lot of people don't really understand why we do it, we just do it. Uh, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of information, it's about this thick, of all the information why we do all these customs. So I just chose a few that we'll go through and, uh, and point them out, why we do them. So we mentioned that we go to a, a grave of a tzaddik, a righteous person, before Rosh Hashanah. So, one of the many reasons we go to the grave of a tzaddik is because we want to pray for somebody else. I don't know if you are on our uh, WhatsApp group, but last week, before uh, Shabbat, I said a story. I'll just repeat it real quick. That there were two men, and they were on a ship. The ship got stuck in a, in a storm and drowned the whole ship sank into the water, everybody drowned. These two men found themselves on a deserted island and they didn't know what to do. So there's nothing there. What's left to do? Let's pray. They decided they're gonna pray. Since they wanted to make sure that their prayers had done the best way and they wanted to know whose prayers are better, they decided to divide the island in half. And they said, this part of the island is yours, this part of the island is mine. And they went and prayed. The first person prayed, what do you pray on a deserted island? You pray for food. He prayed for food, and sure enough, a couple hours later, he walks around and what do you know? He sees a tree, a fruit tree, and he has what to eat. The other person, nothing. Since the first person saw that his prayer worked, so he started praying even more. He started praying for a place of shelter. He found a place to, to hide. He was praying for some uh, clothes, he found some rags to put him himself, and everything that he prayed for was, uh, was fulfilled. Then what do you really pray for when you're stuck on a deserted island? You pray to be helped, to be rescued. So he prayed to be rescued, and sure enough, the next day a boat of tourists land on the island, and he, he's rescued, he jumps on the boat. As he's going up on the boat, he's He's not even thinking of his friend. He's not even thinking of telling him, hey, there's a boat. A heavenly voice comes out and says, hello, didn't you forget your friend? He says, no, he's not my friend. I didn't forget him. He's not my friend. The heavenly voice tells him, what do you mean he's not your friend? He says, he's not my friend. You know why he's not my friend? Because I don't want to be friends with somebody that his prayers didn't get answered. I prayed and whatever I prayed for got answered. And he prayed, I don't know what he prayed for, but he didn't get anything. He's stuck there without food, without water, without shelter. The heavenly court, the heavenly voice that spoke to him was the voice of Hashem. That told him, you know, that your friend also prayed like you. And everything that he prayed was also granted. I said, really? I didn't see him getting anything. He says, yes, because he prayed that your prayers will be accepted. So, Hashem likes it when we pray for others. And when we pray for others, that's when our prayers get answered. When I pray on somebody else, that's when my prayers get answered. So one of the reasons why we go to the, to the uh, grave site is not to pray for me, it's rather to pray to somebody else. That's why you see in many places people will tell you, I'm going to that grave, give me some names. And if you already go to the grave site, then take some names with you. Because it's not so good to pray in a grave site for yourself. And you want to make sure that you're mentioning other people's names. Especially on Rosh Hashanah. Because if you mention only your name, 
then chas v'shalom, that can rise a prosecution from Shemaim. Well, what is he praying for? Look what he did the entire year. How much lashon hara, how much stealing and cheating and here and there, all sorts of things. Therefore, when I go and pray to somebody else, then A, that I don't, ar ar don't arise any prosecution against me. But the point is that Hashem likes it when I pray for other people. Hashem says, I know what you need, trust me. Uh, I have access to your bank account. I know how much money you have there. I have access to your me medical records. I know your, your health situation. I am God. I know everything. You don't have to tell me what you, what you need or what you don't need. I want you to pray to somebody else. Of course. If you write into the Rebbe, I heard you couldn't, like, if you write in for a bracha to the Rebbe, you should write only about yourself if you want a bracha. You shouldn't be writing to somebody else. Is it different if you're writing? No, if you're writing a pan for a tzaddik, I'm not talking about writing a pan. Pan is a pidyo nefesh that you write something for yourself. I'm talking when you go to the grave and you want to pray for somebody. Sorry. Writing a pan, pan is, is the acronym of pidyo nefesh, that you write like a letter. Then you pour your heart out. Here I'm talking more about that you're going to the gravesite. Usually a person, why would they go to a grave of a tzaddik? They need the Yeshua, they need salvation, they need to get pregnant, they need Parnassah, they need a Shalom Bayit, whatever there is. So it's much more powerful when you pray for somebody else and, and instead of praying for myself. Now another thing, you can mention your name, but as long as it's with other names. Of course it's you want to mention your name. And of course you want to pray, say a pray for yourself. But you mainly want to go to pray for other people. You want to pray for your parents and your children and your siblings. And you want to pray for the people that annoy you. And you want to pray for the people that are having arguments with you. And you want to pray for, for everything. You want to pray for the entire Klal Israel, you want to pray for the entire world, you want to pray for everything, and by the way, uh, you know, a little bit of money is not going to be so bad, and uh, some nachat and some health, but the point is that I want to go and pray to, for somebody else. Our sages told, says in the Gemara, somebody prays for his friend, his wishes will be fulfilled and granted much faster, and before even. Now, Somebody asked me that question, that's why I, I thought it would be important to mention. If you notice when we pray in the 10 days of tshuva, we mention every time that we say uh, the word shalom, we add the, he, the a letter he, ha shalom. And if you notice in the 10 days of tshuva, then in a shul, the chazan will say kaddish and he will say, say shalom mi mormav, suddenly the whole congregation, ha shalom. And every time, as a, every time you say Shalom, everybody screams to you, Ha Shalom. Why do we say Ha Shalom? So, the gematria of the word Ose is the gematria of an angel that his name is Sapriel. Sapriel is the angel that is uh, in charge of all the writing. He's the angel that writes everything. How you say in English that you should be scribed in the book of life? Inscribed or inscribed? So not too long ago I said to somebody, subscribed. He started, <laughs> he started laughing. I said, no, no, I meant you, sub you, should, 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 you should subscribe to our email list and to our WhatsApp group. And by the way, also subscribe to our, to you. So we had a good laugh. So the angel that is in charge of the, how do you, would you say, inscribing? And the writing, that's the name, his name is Sapriel. And he has the numer same numerical value of the word Ose. Like we say, Ose Shalom Bimromav. And uh, when we uh, mention him for a good life, then he, he's the one who's in charge of doing the, the peace. Now, when we, ha when we add the hey, or say ha shalom, why do we do that? Why do we add the hey? Because the word ose is the same gematria of his name, but the word ha shalom 
also is the same value, the same gematria of his name. So we want to, to mention his name while we're praying through the entire week. Well, it doesn't matter if it's the verb, but what is just the word ose? So the, the word ose, ein, vav, shin, hey. Yeah, yeah the, ah, okay, that's what you meant, the ose. But the word hashalom, then we add the hey, that's also the same gematria of the same angel. That why, that's why we mention his name and we, we ask him to bless us with shalom, with ose shalom. So we... Yes, the hey, exactly. No, the, the, the scribe, no, his name is Sapriel, but the numerical value of the word Ose and the numerical value of Hashalom is his, the same numerical value of his name. When we're saying that, then we're mentioning, so to say, his name. So, and for that, we're asking him the same way that we say Ose Shalom Bimolav. When do we add this Shalom? In Kaddish. In Kaddish and at the end of Shmona Yisre. In the, in the end of Shmona Yisre, we say Oseh Shalom Bim Romav. And at the, at the end of Kaddish, we say, we say Oseh Shalom Bim Romav. So that's where we end to say HaShalom. HaShalom, we're adding the hey for to match up his name. Meaning that we want him to, scry, to write us in the book of life, of book of peace. That we should have peace in our life. A peace between uh, us and other people. Peace, sometimes most people need peace within themselves. Forget about peace between other people. Just to have peace in our life, to have shalom. So I, I uh, was asked a few times why we say ha-shalom. That's the reason why we do it. Now, of course, the most popular question that many people ask is why do we dip the apple, apple in the honey? Uh, you know, every three-year-old, you ask them what you do in Rosh Hashanah, they tell you you dip the apple in the honey. So there are many different reasons for that. And we do all sorts of simanim. That the common ones is the, the apple and the honey. Uh, we eat a pomegranate. We, some people eat a head of a ram. Some e people eat a head of a, of a ship, sheep. And I mean, it's not the nicest sight to have on your table. So now we, people buy a head of a fish. I don't think it would go so well uh, having a head of a ram on the table, but, <laughs> but uh, we do it with the head of a fish. Uh, I mean, the apple, we're gonna go in a second why we do the apple, because that's a little bit more interesting. But the pomegranate, I never counted. The rumor says that there are 613 uh, seeds in the pomegranate, corresponding to the 613 mitzvot. I always tell my kids to count, they break at 200 and 300, they already break and they get confused and they count again and then again they get confused and then they reach to 500 and something and some of the kids moves one of the seeds away and starts a whole, starts a whole argument and for Shlom Bite reasons we stop counting the seeds. One day we'll, we'll manage to do it, but we, whether, is, whether there's 613 or not, the pomegranate is known to be a fruit that has many, many seeds that we eat. So we want our mitzvot, our, our good deeds, to multiply and to be in the quantities like the, the seed, seeds of the pomegranates, besides that it's one of the seven species. And if you notice in Tzfat, there are many uh, pomegranate trees. There is very mystical things in the pomegranate. Uh, which is kind of equivalent to the apples. That's why there's a big question. Why do we eat the apple? Shouldn't we eat, uh, they, they use one of the seven species? Maybe dates, or maybe a fig. Maybe it will be a little bit more appropriate. So we'll go in a second why we're eating with the apple. But the head of the fish or the ram is that the reason why some people use the ram is to, to remind Hashem about the ram that Avraham Avinu found right after he was supposed to sacrifice Yitzchak. Uh, the head of the fish, we do that because we, we're mentioning that we should be for a head and not for a tail. 
more, more of a, a deeper meaning is that our entire existence comes from our intelligence. The teachings of Hasidut explains that we have to bring ourselves to a point that my intellect, my moach, controls my heart. Moach shalit el Usually, my heart, where all my emotions are, that's more powerful. And my character traits and my emotions, that what will be driving me. The teachings of Hasidut brings us to understand that I have to have mind over heart. And my mind should be more powerful whether for the good and the bad, preventing myself from doing bad things and, of course, uh, pushing me to do good things. So, I want to, to, when I'm doing all these signs, it's not just to do it quick and for the ceremony, it's to meditate, meditate on something more deeper. So, when I'm meditating that I want my mitzvot to multiply like the seeds of the pomegranate, I have to have a little prayer in my mind saying to the Kadosh Baruch I, I hope you will allow me this year to do a lot of mitzvot. I mentioned it in a different lecture that uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned it on Sunday that when I was in one of the lectures now in, in uh, the States, there's a community that I go to every time that I go to the West Coast, it's in Phoenix. And there's a young boy there that I've been going there already for the past couple of years. So I saw him since he was maybe 11. And now he's probably 14 or 15, a very, very special young boy. In all my lectures, he always sits there. Usually the kids run around outside, or there's no kids. And he always has these sharp, sharp questions. And, uh, and he, now he's already uh, 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 after Bar Mitzvah, very, very serious young man. So he came to me this trip and he told me, how do you reach true humbleness? 14, 15 year old boys asking me how to be humble. So, of course, I gave him a short answer. You can actually find that answer. That video went online very fast. And with the answer. But one of the things that I told him, I told him you have to thank Hashem for everything that He does for you. And, and, and to acknowledge every little thing that Hashem does. And I mentioned, when you do a mitzvah, don't take it for granted. Don't, don't hold yourself that you are the one who's doing the mitzvah and you should get the credit. On the contrary, you have to have, thank Hashem quietly for allowing you to do the mitzvah. And I told him, before you put filling on, when I do a mitzvah, whether it's filling or I bench or I put tzitzit on or anything it is, regarding, b b besides the, the, the official bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melcholam, I always say a little pray quietly and I say, Hashem, thank you. Thank, me for, thank you for allowing me to do the mitzvah. Thank you for removing the yetzer hara that I don't have now uh, a yetzer hara to do this mitzvah or not. And before I put filin on, I say to Hashem, even sometimes in three words, thank you. Thank you. I have the intention. Even don't have to have a 15 minute prayer. Is to uh, acknowledge the fact that Hashem allows you to do the mitzvah. And I explained to that young man, I told him, you know how many men, they have such a yetzer hara and they don't want to put filin on. I'm not talking about secular men that don't know what filin is. I'm talking about men that they are f f religious men. They're uh, observant and they have filin and they just have a yetzer hara. They, they don't want to put it on. And they put it on either at four in the afternoon or six in the evening or a minute before shkia or don't at all because they have a yetzer hara. And when I don't, then I say to them, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to participate in your mitzvah. We take it for granted. I think I, I need to get credit for me doing a mitzvah. Like as if Hashem needs to, to tell me bravo and clap my, my, his hands when I bother to, to do something. It's the other around. I have to thank Hashem for allowing me to participate in his mitzvot and to be part of the, part of the group. And then he lets me in. So when you really thank Hashem for, uh, I'm not talking about thanking Hashem for th sending you your other half or parnasah or health. That's, that's not, not even a question that you have to thank Hashem. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm asking, thanking Hashem for allowing me to do a mitzvah. I put tzitzit on, you know how many men they don't put tzitzit on? They're like, it's too hot, I don't want to. It's messing up my shirt, it's, it's, com it's not comfortable. It's a yetzer hara. You know how many 
uh, uh, people, they don't do certain mitzvah, and of course they blame it on the entire world, but it's because for whatever reason they didn't, know, didn't have the merit, Hashem didn't, doesn't include them there. Not that Chas Shalom is saying that Hashem is, no wants to include you, you have to make an effort. But I quietly thank Hashem for everything that He allows me to do. That brings you to a very high level of humility, that you humble in front of Hashem, that He allows to, to, to include you. So when I'm eating the, the pomegranate seeds, not, it's not because I like the pomegranates, it's because I have to have in my mind by saying Hashem, I want you to give me a lot of opportunities to do mitzvot this year. The same way that I'm eating all these seeds and this uh, fruit has a lot of seeds in it, please give me a lot of opportunities to do mitzvot. Give me the opportunity to have some extra money so I can do a lot of charity. Give me some extra time so I can do a lot of acts of kindness. Remove the yetzeraz that I can do as many mitzvot that I possible this year. And same thing with the fish. I, the entire year, I have a whole struggle between my intellect and my, my emotions, my character traits. When I'm eating the fish, you don't have to eat the head, it's just uh, to signify, is to pray to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, allow me this year to have the, the, the right ability and the awareness and the power to have my mind more powerful than my emotions, that I'll be able to succeed in the battle and mind over heart. And when it comes to the apple, of course there's a big question, why, why an apple? I think it should have been one of the seven grains. So first of all, we have a custom, I don't know if you noticed, many people don't do it, we actually dip the bread in the honey. We don't dip bread in salt. During uh, Rosh Hashanah, some people have the custom to dip bread in honey till the last day of Sukkot. That's what we do. So, first of all, that already covers the question that I am putting one of the seven grains in the honey. Because I'm putting the bread, that's already flour. The reason for the apple, there are many, many different reasons. I've mentioned that, that we mentioned on Sunday, that the Ben Ishchai, which the Ben Ishchai was teaching many hidden things in Kabbalah, he explains that the apple has three qualities. It's a very beautiful fruit. Usually, if you go to the greengrocer, you'll see they put the apples outside. It's a very beautiful fruit, many different colors. Even if you notice that, you know, one of the most popular uh, devices in technology, the emblem is an apple, the iPhone, the iMac, the iPads. Uh, the person, the engineer there, who invented this revolutionary technology also had a very, a very revolutionary fruit to put on it. The apple is a very pretty and beautiful fruit. More than that, it smells good. That's that's the symbol of incompletion. The knowledge. I mean, that's a hoax. I told you last uh, sh uh, 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 class when I mentioned a, a different class about the apple, then somebody from the crowd screamed, uh, I said that the Ben Ishchai said that the apple has three qualities. It's a beautiful fruit, it smells good, and, and it's also a very tasty. So somebody from the crowd screamed that it's also the, uh, the, the fruit that Adam and Chava ate. And I was like, eh. Wrong. <laughs> Who told you they ate an apple? That's a that's a myth. <laughs> teachers give kids give teachers apples. Yes. Yeah, I, I, that I don't know. But the person in the crowd said that uh, I, Adam and Chava ate an apple, which is a hundred percent wrong. They didn't eat an apple. And then somebody from the crowd screamed, you know, it's also, you can add to the three qualities, you can add the fourth quality, it's healthy. So he said one apple a day keeps the doctor away. But the, regarding what you said, yes, the apple, I don't know why it comes from like that, I know where they may, might have bring it. But people think that the apple is, the tree of knowledge was the apple, and that's why the symbol of the company apple is an apple, but there's a bite in it. I see it, the bite in it is the, symbolizes the imperfection. 
but really we're going to learn about it in a second there is something spiritual a spiritual place that is called Chakal Tapuchin Kadishin an orchard of holy apples I've mentioned that that if you go to the synagogue here of the Arizal it says on the arch right before you're going in Chakal Tapuchin Kadishin the Arizal was explaining it we'll get to it in a second first we'll cover what the Ben Ishchai says the Ben Ishchai says that it has three qualities this uh, fruit uh, it looks pretty it smells good and it's tasty and these three uh, qualities correspond to three things that we pray for, which is Bane, Chaye, and Mezone. Uh, kids, le, uh, life, and sustenance. Of course, the kids, we're not only praying to have kids, we want them to be healthy kids. We want them to have Yirat Shamaim, to be God fearing, and uh, to go on the path of the Torah, and so forth, to be happy kids, good kids. And we're praying for life, so we should have a long life, and we should have a healthy life. And that's also including the health. And mazone, of course, we need parnasa. That never helps. So that's one of the one of the reasons. That's what the Ben Ishchai says. Regardless, that we explain that. I don't want to repeat it too much. You can find it on the class on Sunday if you if you weren't here. But the the wine that arouses a lot of judgments. That's why we always do Kiddush on the wine to sweeten the judgments. But the apple, the Ben Ishchai says that the apple, the actual apple is sweetening the judgments. And another reason, this is why the Rizal explains why we eat the apple. He says, Remez ma shochlim tapuach bedvash al derech apaitan tamuchim bedeshen se akida. He says something very interesting because Ki amru zal asher makom adeshem amidash nikra tapuach The place where they used to have the, the altar in the Bet HaMikdash they used to have deshen Deshen is like the, what they used to put under the mezbeach the, like the, what they used to burn and the, the place where they used to put the deshen is called tapuach an apple now, when they used to sacrifice, what they used to sacrifice on the altar, they used to put a, a sheep. Now, sheep in Hebrew is called se. Some people, I mean, you can call it keves, and you can also call it se. The word se akida has the same numerical value of the word tapuach. That veze bedeshen se akida al ken ochlim tapuach lermoz al se akida shenim tekud dinei itzchak beAbraham kayadua. Now the the sacrifice. One of the reasons where we have the sacrifices, because when Abraham Avinu when he went to sacrifice itzchak, he of course didn't, and then he sacrificed the ram. After that, one of the sacrifices that we have is this this uh, sheep, which is called in Hebrew Se and Se Akida has the numerical value of besides the, the Deshen what they add uh, uh, to the Mizbeach where they used to keep it has the word apple uh, the, it was called Tapuach where they keep it and we we eating the apple we putting it into honey because the apple is sweetening the judgments again the same idea of sweetening the judgments the, the book that is called Bnei Sachar it's a book of Kabbalah he explains that he actually explains uh, 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 based uh, based on the on the teachings of the Rizal that in the spiritual world there is a place that is called Chakal Tapuchin Kadishin, which is uh, in between the worlds. There are many different spiritual worlds. One of the highest worlds. We, we can relate what it means when the, the when a tzaddik, like the Arizal, he has a, 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 a spiritual vision. And that's why when we read books of Kabbalah, a lot of the times we don't understand what he's talking about. Because he has a certain vision, he sees what's going on, and then he writes it down. So in his vision, he saw an orchard of holy apples. What does it mean? We don't understand in his level what an orchard of holy apple means. 
But we know this comes from a very high and spiritual world where the worlds, they go in an hierarchy, what's called a descending chain. And one of the stops of the world is called the, this orchard of holy apples. When we take the apple, this is something that we don't really understand what it means. We just go by the, the, the instructions. And when we take the apple, that's obviously the spiritual essence of the apple comes from this spiritual world. And we're dipping it into the honey. Then we're sweetening the judgments in the world above. Because on Rosh Hashanah, there's a lot of judgments against us. For everything that we did. Everything that we did, there's a, a, a judgment against us. And we have the Satan that comes to prosecute against us. That's one of the reasons why we blow the Shofar, because we, we wanted to confuse him. I mentioned on Sunday that we don't really confuse him. He's not, uh, not that not intelligent. I gave a quick, a funny story how when we blow the Shofar, the, we blow air into the heavenly court and all the papers, the notes that he has, they're all flying around there. But there are persecutions against us and what happens is the prosecution is arousing judgments, what's called dinim. And we want to sweeten the dinim because when we sweeten the dinim, the judgments, they turn into chasadim, they turn into to kindness. So that's one of the many reasons why we take the apples, that it's spiritual source, that's essence, the, the godly spark of the apple comes from this orchard, from this holy orchard, the Chakal Tapuchin Kadishin, and we want to sweeten it. As Rav Hashem, very soon Mashiach is going to come, he's going to explain to us what does it mean even that orchard. Now the Beni Sachar explains that uh, We mentioned that some people don't do the simanim the second night. And there, some people do the simanim the second night. Besides, one of the reasons, uh, spiritual reasons why we do simanim, siman is a sign. If you remember, in the beginning uh, when uh, Yitzhak was supposed to marry Leah, he wanted, sorry, he was supposed to marry Rachel. He came to Lavan and he told him, I want to marry your daughter. And he says, no problem, I want you to work for me for seven years. He worked for seven years, and then he was supposed to marry Rachel. And then, of course, Lavan switched Rachel and Leah, and he ended up mar marrying Leah, and then he had to work another seven years for Rachel. If you remember in the story, then Leah was giving the simanim to Rachel. Uh, sorry, it's the other way around. The, the Rachel was giving this, the signs to Leah. And, uh, and that's how they, 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 then she knew. Now, the Simanim, she had all sorts of like uh, secret uh, codes to, to, for her to know. And Rachel gave the Simanim to Leah. Now, in the teachings of Kabbalah, in the book of Nei Sachar, he explains that the first night of Rosh Hashanah, is coming from the concept of what's called in Kabbalah Ima Ila'a. Ima Ila'a is Leah, and this corresponds to the sphere of Bina. And the second night of Rosh Hashanah corresponds to Rachel. And Rachel is what's called Ima Tata'a, a lower level mother, which corresponds to the sphere of Malchut. Uh, I don't want to mention it now, but I do have a lecture online why we actually celebrate two days of Rosh Hashanah. Because technically, we don't need to celebrate two days, especially when we're in Israel. In Israel, we don't celebrate two days. We celebrate one day of Pesach, one day of Sukkot, one day of everything. It's in the diaspora that we do two days. But Rosh Hashanah, even in Israel, we, we celebrate two days. Because of that Excuse me? Because of that there are many reasons why we do it. I have an actually interesting lecture online why we do two nights. I mean, one of the reasons, because one night uh, the, uh, we, we, uh, our, our actions are being judged. One night, the intentions are being ju uh, the kavana is being judged, and there are many other different things. No need to repeat now. But even in the teachings of the Kabbalah, the the, the, the book, the Bnei Sachar, they bring it, he brings it down that each night corresponds to one different level of our matriarchs, which one of them corresponds to Leah, and one of them corresponds to Rachel. In the teachings of Kabbalah, it's constantly talking about there are two mothers. 
the sphere of Bina and the sphere of Malchut. The Bina is Leah, which is called the higher level Ima, Ima Ila, and Rachel is Malchut, is the Ima Tata. The first night is corresponding to Leah, second night corresponds to Rachel, and Rachel gave the Simanim to Leah. So therefore, we do the Simanim, all these signs, for the first night. The Simanim, for us, they look like a ritual. Same thing with the, in the, in the story that Rachel, Leah, Rachel gave the Simanim to Leah. Spiritually, Rachel was giving these godly sparks to Leah. Our entire Avodat Hashem, our entire spiritual work is to take everything that comes from the world of Asiya, which is corresponding to the Sphira of Malchut, and to elevate it to a higher level. And we want to elevate it to the Sphira of Bina. So giving the Simanim, when Rachel gave the Simanim to Leah, she gave her the ability to elevate all these godly sparks. That's again one of the other, other reasons why we, we uh, uh, do uh, all these Simanim. Now, another interesting thing, we mentioned that we eat uh, pomegranate, we eat the head of the fish, we eat the, the honey, the, the apple and the honey. One thing that we do, uh, okay, one thing that we do that has nothing to do with the simanim, that is also brought by the Bnei Sachar, is that we want to make sure that we don't sleep at night. We don't sleep uh, as much as possible. Why we don't want to sleep? It says in the, in the Talmud, in the Yerushalmi, that uh, a certain angel that is in charge of my mazal, of my uh, fortune, my luck, he is awake when I'm awake and he's asleep when I'm asleep. And if every time that I go to sleep, then my mazal, so to say, goes to sleep with me. And on Rosh Hashanah, when I need the mazal to be strong, then I don't want the, my, my mazal to go to sleep. You mean the morning of Rosh Hashanah? Yeah, it's morning of the day. You shouldn't sleep. I mean, if you want to take a nap, then to have uh, energy throughout the day, throughout the night, then yeah. But again, if you can maybe get a good night's sleep tonight, that's better. But Arizal says actually that it's true, better not to go to sleep. But after midnight, after Chatzot, then it's okay already to go to sleep. I mean, you can't be up now for two days. That's not, a, that's not the solution. But uh, when, the, when we're talking about midnight, we're talk, not talking about 12 a.m. Midnight, Chatzot, you have to look in the calendar of where you live. It's more like 12.45, 12.40, 12.30, depending where you are. And the Rizal says it's actually okay to go to sleep after that. Uh, we don't need to go on a marathon of, uh, of not sleeping. Now, quickly, just one thing about the Shofar. You, you, this, the thing is that the, the whole teachings of Hasidut boils down to explaining it's constantly a cycle so yes the sphere of Malchut is receiving from above and it's constantly receiving everything that only originates from Bina but it's receiving in order for it to so to say recycle and to elevate it by, back up so you're right that the Bina is the sphira that births everything and it's affecting and influencing all the sphira below but this malchut that is receiving everything is in order to to give it over one uh, way of looking at it that the malchut is always going to be above the keter of the next world so the malchut is now re giving to the world below but even in the Avodat Hashem, the Malchut is the one who gave, receives everything in order to refine it and then elevate it back to its source. Now, <clears throat> just uh, one quick thing. Somebody asked me, so I wanted to, to point it out. Why do we say before the Tkiat Shofar seven times a certain verse that we mention? It's La Matzeach Livnei Koach Mizmor Shir. We mention it, we read it seven times seven times in a row. 
So one of the reasons is that it has a 597, 597 verse, uh, words when you put all of them together. 500 and tough Tav Kuf Zayin, so 500, 90, 597 words in these seven verses. The 597 words is the gematria of the word shofar. So that's one of the reasons. Besides that they have, it has in it seven times the word elokim. And one needs to, to elokim comes from the side of Gvura, and Hashem has many different names. The Shem of Yudke Vavke comes from Chesed, and the Shem Elokim is, comes from Gvura. We want to repeat it seven times that, again, the Gvurot is going to be sweetened. The entire thing is what we need to do constantly throughout uh, Rosh Hashanah is constantly sweetening the judgments, sweetening the judgments. Because on Rosh Hashanah is when the judgments are being are being uh, uh, aroused. So we constantly want to sweeten the judgments with the Tkiyat Shofar, with all the Simanim that we do, with, uh, with reading Tilim and so forth. Uh, let's do a few more things quickly. If you noticed that when we read the, the Korbanot in the, in the parasha of Pinchas, we say, we constantly saying, Vasitem Ola, that you did, you, you should do the sacrifice that is called Ola. But, if you noticed, let me read it out from here, Tam Shebechol HaKorbanot Sheparashat Pinchas Omer Vikravtem Ola. In the parasha of Pinchas, it constantly says that you should sacrifice a Ola, an offering, but it uses the word Vikravtem. Mikravdim means, comes from the word korban, that you have to sacrifice the ola, the sacrifice of uh, uh, the offering. But, if you notice, on Rosh Hashanah, we change the words, and in the korban, in the sacrifice of Rosh Hashanah, we don't say vikravdim, rather we say vasitem, and you should do it. Why? Lefishim adam oset tshuva berosh Hashanah, because if a person does tshuva on Rosh Hashanah, that's what, we, we, what's, what's we're supposed to do, מעלה עליו הקדוש ברוך הוא כאילו עכשיו נעשה בעולם. הקדוש ברוך הוא is uh, 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 counting him like as if he just was created. Which means when I'm doing tshuva on Rosh Hashanah, it's such a powerful day to do tshuva. And if it's done from the depth of my heart, then Hashem is, is, is uh, 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 holding it, uh, counting it like as if I'm completely new. Excuse me? Kind of like, yeah, one can say like a resurrection of the dead. You're brand new. And, and it says, Like as if now he was created. So the reason that's why we say Vasitem, that Vasitem means to do, because when a person does the right tshuva, Hashem is going to consider like he's completely fresh, brand new, like it was just created. Mm-hmm. This is important to, to, to take into consideration how powerful is the tshuva that we can do on Rosh Hashanah. And the tshuva, excuse me? Anybody can be healthy? Hypothetically, yes, you have the potential to do such tshuva on Rosh Hashanah. I call it a re, a reset yourself to factory mode. Now you have on all the electronic device, especially on phones, that you have a button that you reset the settings to factory mode. So, if a person does 100% shuva, hypothetically, it can be uh, considered completely brand new and everything should be removed. So if chas v'shalom, the sickness, is because of a sin, then the sickness will disappear. Sometimes the sickness is not because of a sin. Sometimes the sickness is part of the Tikkun, or the test, the Nisayon that a person has to go through, and then, uh, and then it has nothing to do with Tshuva. I heard that we, we should forget everything that, that we have right now, like Rosh Hashanah, forget who you are, forget what you have this year, you don't have anything, you're nothing, yeah. you're zero, and you're starting anew. 
That's part of the tshuva. Part of the tshuva is erasing the existence of everything that you did throughout the year. And it's not easy. I mean, if you remember in the story when Avraham Avinu was uh, hosting the angels, and if you remember the story, he's sitting outside the tent, very hot day, he's on the third day of the circumcision, three angels come, he brings them into the tent, starts making food to them, and then one of the angels is coming to say that in the next year, Sarah will have a child. And it says in the Torah that Sarah was standing outside of the tent and laughing. But it's Chak Sarah. Hashem turned around and says, you laughing? I'm sending you an angel to telling you that you're going to be pregnant. You laughing? You question my ability? Sarah says, I wasn't laughing. Hashem says, well, what do you mean you weren't laughing? I heard you laughing. It even says in the Torah. Sarah says, no, I didn't laugh. Hashem is like, what are you playing a game. Sarah says, no, I didn't laugh. Maybe the old Sarah laugh, laughed. I did tshuva. I didn't laugh. So she did such a high level tshuva that even in her existence, she, I, I didn't laugh. She erased it. There wasn't any laughter. This is a high level tshuva. The Zohar calls it tshuva ila'a. If I uh, able to do such a high level tshuva, it didn't even exist. I didn't even, I didn't even do it. Why did she do tshuva? Because she laughed. She kind of had doubt in the power of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem said, I'm going to make you pregnant, and she laughed. She was like, I'm 90 years old. How can I be pregnant? Right away, she, she caught herself, and she did tshuva. And she did such a high-level tshuva that when Hashem asked her, why did you laugh? She told him, I didn't laugh. Because she was already in such a high level of tshuva, she didn't even remember. She, she, she said later, Maybe the old Sarah laughed. I'm the new one. I did tshuva. I don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't even exist. I erased it. I told you once the difference between the high level tshuva and the lower level tshuva. This is the concept that the Zohar is talking about. Tshuva ila'a, tshuva tata'a. The, the terminology Hasidut uses is tshuva from love, tshuva ma'ava, and tshuva mi'ira, from fear. My analogy is if you have a desktop and you have on the desktop all sorts of files, now you take these files and you throw them into the trash. This is corresponding to tshuva tata'a, low level tshuva. Because at any given moment you can go to the trash and pull out those files and bring them back to the desktop. Tshuva la'a is when you empty the trash. That's it, the files are gone. You can never retrieve those files. They're completely destroyed. That's a high level tshuva, that the files don't exist anymore. Most of us when we do tshuva, we just put the, the files in the trash, but we don't empty the trash. I'm talking about an analogy of a computer. So a tshuva itata'a is I did tshuva, I didn't do it anymore. But the, the sin is still existing. The concept exists. We want to strive to reach to tshuva ila'a that it doesn't exist. That I did such a tshuva on that day that Hashem is like, like as if He just created me. And that's what I want, what I want to reach. And of course, that if one does that, there's a good chance that uh, that uh, any sickness should be should be healed. Quickly, a few more things. We mentioned that we go to a river or to a pond or to uh, uh, the beach somewhere that has fish. Why do we do that? I mean, why is it important to have fish? It says in the in the first of all, why do we go to the water? It says in the Midrash that when Avraham Avinu went to take Yitzchak to be sacrificed, the Satan, the devil, put ten obstacles. One of the obstacles that he put, he put a river, a fake river. I mean, the Satan can do whatever he wants, so he created a river. Avraham Avinu was determined, he went into the river, the water first reached his ankles, then his knees, then his waist, then his chest, then his throat and then the water was going higher and higher and higher and at some point the water was already reaching the, the mouth then Avraham Avinu says Hashem Hoshia Hashem Kivao Maim Ad Nafesh the water came up to where my nefesh is and up and the water disappeared so that's one of the many reasons why we do go to a place with water 
to signify the, the determination of Avraham Avinu to, for the sacrifice. And Hashem puts us sometimes in situations that the water, so to say, I feel like that's it, it's, I'm up to my max. Hashem, that's it, I can't take this test anymore. And the second that I pray for the salvation, for the Yeshua of Hashem, the test disappears. Well, that's one of the many reasons why we go to the water, but we mentioned before that we have to have fish in it. The reason why we have fish, one of the many reasons is, first of all, is that fish don't close their eyes. Their eyes are constantly open. And there is a verse that we read uh, a lot during Rosh Hashanah and uh, Yom Kippur, that it says, that the gatekeeper, the guardian of the, the, the nation, he doesn't take naps and he doesn't sleep at all. A person who has the eyes open all the time never sleeps. So we want to arouse the, the kindness of the Kadosh Baruch that never sleeps, that are his eyes are always, good, are always open, so to say. Hashem doesn't have eyes, but just for the parable. So we want the fish to, to, to signify the same idea, the same way that the fish don't close their eyes, that Hashem should not close our, his eyes. Because when does, when does Hashem have the motion of closing his eyes? And he doesn't want to see what I do. If, I, if my kid did something embarrassing, then, then I'm called to the school. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. Sometimes I see my kid does something. That just the other day, one of my kids did something that wasn't so nice. And, you know, for a second I moved my head. It's like, it's like embarrassing. Later on, I didn't want to embarrass the kid. I came after and I said, why did you do this and that? It's not appropriate. It's not nice. I mean, it's a young kid, but still. But the few moments that the kid behaved like that, I'm talking about one of my kids, I, I was embarrassed, not embarrassing, but, and I kind of like moved my head, even even without noticing. So when do some, we do something that is not appropriate, Hashem has kind of the motion of closing his eyes. I don't want to see what you're doing. Because if I'll see what you're doing, it's going to make me upset. Chas is going to make me angry. So Hashem, we don't want Hashem to close his eyes, meaning to, to acknowledge our negative things. Rather to acknowledge our positive things, and Hashem should open his eyes, constantly just looking at the good and positive things that we do. He didn't say I can't take it anymore. He just said the water came up to the level where my soul is, which means that if I'm going to continue going a little bit more, because the nefesh goes through the nose. So, and if the water will go above the nose, then the nefesh is going to have to go out. The message for, for us is, if you want to ask him what's the message for us is, is that we're constantly battling all sorts of tests. Is that we're asking Hashem, we don't want the tests to come to a point that I can't take it anymore. Is there a line? Avraham says, Hashem, Hoshia. Hoshia, save me. Ki yigiu ma'im ad nafesh. No. That's what Abraham said. Abraham said, Hashem, Hoshia, help me. Ki yigiu ma'im ad nafesh. So, that's, that's what we want to concentrate on. Regardless, you know, with the fish, fish, if you notice, uh, many people, what they do is they use a fish when uh, they, they when they, people want to get like a neged ainara, they want chas v'shalom to have a ainara, they have a symbol of a fish. Because a fish, they don't have ainara, can't control fish. Besides that the fish, the kapara, the atonement of a fish is when you kill it. You don't have to slaughter a fish. An uh, animal, a cow, a sheep, chicken, we have to slaughter it in order to eat it. Fish, we don't have to slaughter them. And the kapara of the fish is when it dies. When it dies, that's it's what makes it kosher. So again, the same idea is that we want Hashem to give us kapara, to get to atone to our sins, like a fish. You take it out of the water, that's it, that's its kapara. Same thing with us. Now, you might have noticed what a lot of people do after tashlich, they shake their clothes. Some people shake their uh, tzitzit like this. Some people do it, we do it also, this is based on the teachings of the Kabbalah, we do it also on uh, 
on Kiddush Levana. We shake a little bit our clothes and we shake the tzitzit. Same thing, you, if you notice, some people do it uh, in Tashlech. That's because we want to shake off the klipot. The klipot, they get attached to our clothes and we want to shake it off. Now, what else? Another interesting thing about the fish is that if you see the word in Hebrew, fish, is dag. And dag has the letter dalid and then gimel. Before you asked me if you can't reach, uh, if you don't have water, what can you do? And I said, you can take a little bowl and put some fish in it. It's good to have at least two fish because one fish is dag, but a few fish is dagim. Dalet, gimel, yud, mem. Inside the word dagim, you have two letters, yud and gimel. And the yud and gimel is 13, the 13 attributes of mercy. Now, when we go to the river, it's not that I'm throwing my sins into the water. Rather, I'm arousing the combination of the water, which the water corresponds to Torah and to concealment. This is the time when we want uh, the Kadosh Baruch to conceal my bad actions, my sins, like the water, Kamaim Layam Mechasim, the same way that the water covers everything. I'm signifying, I'm telling Hashem, I want you to cover now all my sins that there's not going to be prosecution, that the Satan can come and say, oh, but he lied and he cheated. I'm telling Hashem, I want you to conceal, conceal my, my sins. And when the fish is in the water, the fish again, the, the pnimiut, the concealment, the inner letters of the word dagim, fish, plural, is yud and gimel. So I'm arousing the 13 attributes of mercy. And the reason why I walk to the water again is not to throw the, the sins in the water. I can't get rid of my sins. I'm rather asking Hashem to conceal my sins. And on the time of the mishpat, don't show them. So he saw, but the intention is to cover. The intention is to cover, and the reason why we put the fish, like I told you, the word fish in Hebrew, plural, is dagim. Anything that is pnimiut, inside. So we, what's the hint here? Is the, uh, the middle letters, which is yud in the gimel. And by me applying that and reading the certain prayer that I do, I'm arousing the 13 attributes of mercy that Hashem is going to cover my sins and be filled with mercy and forgive me. The whole point is that we want to completely erase everything on Rosh Hashanah, that I'm starting clean. Now, another thing is that I mentioned before with the shaking of the, of the clothes, in a very short explanation, our sages explain that when I do a mitzvah, I create myself a garment. And the same way that I have many mitzvahs, then as many types of pieces to my garment. And if you're looking, for example, at my jacket, then there is a sleeve, there's another piece here, and then there's the collar, and here, and here, and there's many different pieces. If you just would take one piece, if you just have one take piece, it's a... It's a shmate, if I'm just taking one piece of the jacket. But when I put them all together, it creates a beautiful jacket, or a beautiful dress, or a beautiful suit, or whatever it is. Every mitzvah that I do, then I'm adding a piece to this garment. Now what happens when I chas shalom do a sin? Then I create a stain on my garment. If it's a small stain, then it's a small stain. All you need to go is like that. If it's a big sin, chas v'shalom, then it's a big stain. Many sins, many stains. I need to shake off all these sins. When I was younger, not that I'm a dinosaur now, but when I was much, much younger, then I, one of my meshugas, I, I was very into clothing. I always, everything was matching, you know, the sock would match the tie and the belt. I was very into fashion. All my clothes were designer clothes, everything was matched, perfect size. So, and ooh, if a little speck of dust will fall on my Armani suit, oy vavoy, that would be the end of the person who did that. No kids could not be next to me. So in the beginning, when I was dating my wife, I was like, you know, there's nothing touches the, 
If something, a little microscopic stain on the shirt, oh my gosh. And then slowly, slowly, my wife got me into the boot camp of getting dirty. So she would spill things on me and I had to really work on my patience and my anger not to get upset. I would really lose it. And then of course came my first daughter. And you cannot stay clean with kids. You pick up the baby so you have stains here and here and food is everywhere. And so I got used to now I'm all the time dirty. Now people tell me you have, uh, you have, yeah, 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 I, I know, I know. There's food here, dirt here, here it's the stain. So the same way in the spiritual level, our soul is covered with garments. And unfortunately when we do all sorts of negative actions and bad things, and sins, then we cover the garments with these stains. And Rosh Hashanah is a good time to shake off the stains. And when I'm standing in front of the, the pool, the, the pond, whatever it is, the river, and I'm shaking my garments, and I'm also signifying to Hashem, get all these stains off my garments. And of course then comes Yom Kippur and the Yom Kippur washes completely, takes the garment to the dry cleaner when I get it all ironed and in the cover and Baruch Hashem, that's what we want to happen. Uh, let's see if we have, I don't think we have more time. Baruch Hashem. Let me just say one more thing about why we do two days. We don't have much more time. One of the reasons why we have two days of Rosh Hashanah, our sages call it in the Gemara, Yom Ha'arichta, a very long day. And the sages in, our, in the Talmud explains that if I would only have one day of Rosh Hashanah, and let's say Rosh Hashanah would fall on Shabbat. You know what would happen? I can't blow the shofar. And this is the mitzvah of the day. Tiku b'chodesh shofar b'keser le'yom chagenu. That's the mitzvah of the day. So if chas I can't say chas v'shalom, but let's say Rosh Hashanah falls on Saturday, I can't blow the shofar. Therefore our sages said, okay, so we have to do two days. So for sure, I have at least one day that I blow the shofar. That if Rosh Hashanah falls on Saturday, then I have Sunday. If Rosh Hashanah falls on Friday, then either way you're looking at it, I have one day at least to blow the shofar. That's one of the many reasons why we added a second day to the Rosh Hashanah, because technically we don't need to. The reason why they added a second day to the holidays is because the doubt when was Rosh Chodesh, when at the time of the Holy Temple, the way they would set up the month is by witnesses seeing the moon. Since the, the, the land was big, too big and it would take the messengers at least two weeks to get to the outer parts of the land, then they didn't know and they couldn't wait. So they made two days of, of the festival. Rosh Hashanah, we don't need that. So, but that's one of the many reasons. And because the, the shofar is the mitzvah of the day. Besides the fact that Hashem said, I'm going to give you two days, a yom a long, long day, that you have much more to do in that day. Another reason why, you know, we mentioned that Tishrei is not the first month of the year. If you notice, we call the holiday Rosh Hashanah. We don't call it Tchilat Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is head. A Rosh is a head. And so we're basically calling it the head of the year. If it was the beginning of the year, we would call it Tchilat Hashanah, the beginning of the year. The beginning of the year is the month of Nisan. This Rosh Hashanah is the seventh month month. Even when you, excuse me, even when we read in the Torah, it says, Bachodesh Hashvi'i, in the seventh month. The reason why that's the month that was chosen to be judged is because we have a lot of mitzvot from the Torah that we do on that month. We have the Shofar, we have Sukkah, we have Lulav, we have the four species, we have so many mitzvot that we do in that month. We, it's actually the month that has the most concentrated month of mitzvot, mitzvot from the Torah. So Hashem says that should be the month, that should be also the month of judgment, because we're going to have so much mitzvot going on during that month that it will balance it out, that we're coming with so much mitzvot for the month of judgment. Mezrat Hashem, this judgment should be turned to be positive judgment, 
should be just good. And we also want to pray for the entire Yeshua, for Am Israel. We want the judgment to be not, you know, we're praying for the entire world, not only for ourselves, the entire world. Hayom Harat Olam, it says. Today the whole world is trembling. Even though the Gentiles, they don't celebrate Rosh Hashanah, but this is a day for the entire world. Hashem is judging the entire world. We have to pray not only for ourselves, for our own uh, financial situation and our, uh, our health situation. Rather, we have to pray for the entire world that the judgment is not going to be harsh against the entire world. If you're noticing, Hashem is shaking the world completely. I mean, the, the, the nations themselves are also going through storms and tornadoes and hurricanes, earthquakes, fires. So we want to pray for the entire world not to be under the judgment and the dinim should not be so strong because that will allow Mashiach to come bechesed v'rachamim. Chas we want we don't want Mashiach to come in, with judgments. And we want Mashiach to come bechesed v'rachamim. Should happen very soon. We should have a sweet new year. You want me to mention his name? As Rad Hashem, we should keep in our prayers the name of uh, Rav Gavriel Friedman, no? Elisha That's his name? Gabriel. Where do you see the name? What? Elisha Gabriel. Oh, Elisha Gavriel Ben Toba. Okay. How's he doing now? Should have an immediate recovery. As Rad Hashem, we should all add his name to our prayers. And uh, this class should be also to dedicate to his name and his refuah. A very special rabbi, a teacher, and a... a he has a, some disease. As Allah Hashem, we should concentrate this Rosh Hashanah to pray for the entire world, for Am Israel, and Hashem, Bezad Hashem, will bless us with a good, sweet, and happy new year.